And welcome to tonight's seed planting series. Uh, we're going to have a conversation that I hope everyone is uh, excited about. I certainly am. I think the market has been so crazy these last couple of months. It'll be really exciting to get uh, a little bit of knowledge and insight into what's happening. Um, I'll kick it off by introducing our presenters today. Uh, let me get in here. We've got uh, Chief Flockster, Lisa Wise. You've probably uh, known, talked, or seen her um, having these kind of conversations and, and leading the Flock family for the last couple of years. Uh, with her today is Colin Kimple. He's the co-founder of Wealth Insight Partners. They do financial planning both for individuals and for businesses. Um, and he's really going to be walking through kind of the, the way the market is working at the moment, whether you should buy, sell, or hold. Uh, and he'll introduce a little bit about himself and I think some nuances about the market that will make this presentation really exciting. So Lisa, I'll kick it over to you for uh, the, the next step. Great. Laura, thank you so much. I want to thank Colin for taking the time not only to join us tonight, but also for putting together a pretty thoughtful slide deck around how to uh, think through having investment property during this particular time and just overall uh, as a backstory Colin and I crossed paths at a fundraiser for Muriel Bowser uh, when she was running for mayor and uh, somebody invited us over and the person that invited us over was a, a multifamily unit owner who was one of the very first in our portfolio Fred Hill is such an exceptional guy and a big uh, fan of, of ours and, and, and we're a big fan of his he introduced us to Colin and we were, we're at this like really great event. It was before Bowser was mayor and I got a chance to meet Colin there and his, uh, his wife, Suzanne. And we ended up having this really funny story about uh, a, an apartment that they had lived in, a condo that they lived in, uh, that they no longer lived in because they were now, they had converted it to investment property. But uh, they were recalling a story when uh, they just had their first daughter and she was an infant in her car seat and Suzanne had left their unit uh, to, to get something from the hallway and the door locked behind her, but their daughter Jackie was on the inside and Suzanne was on the outside. And she told the story about this, this um, the guy from the management company had basically like taken flight from H Street Northeast and made his way all the way to Swan Street Northwest uh, with the key to let her in and as it turned out I had just made that particular person a job offer <laughs> to come and work for Nest at the time and so from that point forward I think we we're all kindred spirits and we understood that they could appreciate what it meant to be in a management business and then what it meant to have a lot on the line when it comes to making sure that your property is well managed and so Colin and Suzanne have been really great thought partners for us um, in their capacity as financial planners um, we're now uh, managing the, the building that that unit is located in, and over the years, we've been able to use them to help us navigate with our client base, you know, when is it the best time to buy in this economy and in this particular, mar in this particular marketplace? When is it the, the right time to say, uh, this particular investment isn't where we need to be financially and otherwise? Um, and, and what are the different questions that we need to be asking ourselves as investors and, and people that are squarely in the real estate market um, about what the best decisions are. Uh, and this can be a particularly challenging climate. I think one of the things that uh, we're, we're really looking at right now is uh, different, um, you know, diff real estate uh, uh, pricing is all over the map. We're seeing pricing explode, but at the same time, we're seeing different legacy neighborhoods and environments are, are not enjoying the same appreciation and pricing that we've had in the past. And it can be a tricky time to navigate, um, particularly as we're not quite sure what's coming next. And so, uh, with that, Colin has agreed to join us and walk us through all the different nuances of what it means to explore investing in this particular marketplace. And so with that, I'm going to pass it on to him. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Laura. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, when that guy came to give the key, uh, when our daughter was stuck behind the door, it was the wrong key and she's still there. She's 10 and a half. I haven't seen her in 10 years. I'm just kidding. We got her out. Um, so that guy did, did good. But um, Anyways, I'm Colin Kimple. I've got a company called Wealth Insight Partners. Um, I've got a, a business partner, uh, Peter Glassman, and then we have um, seven people that help support us on our team. Um, I'm a certified financial planner. So what does that mean? We help our clients um, get organized so that they can do some thoughtful goal setting and figure out, okay, if I'm trying to get there, and here I am now, like, how do I get there? And what are the paths and what are the steps I need to take in order to get there? Um, 
so our clients hire us and and you know pay us a fee to build them out a plan build them out a plan um, which is a little different from other money management firms which say hey move your money to us then we'll build you out a plan we say well let's build you the plan first and then whether or not you use us for wealth management or not is up to you um, so that's our business. Uh, we work with a lot of um, business owners, entrepreneurs, um, corporate executives. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's who we work with. Um, just a little bit about me and then we'll roll into it. Um, as you, I, I, my wife, Suzanne, we live in Bethesda. I've got uh, three kids, um, Jackie, Sean, and Charlie, who are 10, eight, and five, I think now. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, there it is. You know, got intri- you know, I love cars. I'm a big car guy. I like to, to, to race cars. I like to talk about cars. Um, I'm into CrossFit. I like to play golf. I love live music um, and uh, various uh, community, community uh, organizations I'm involved in, Leadership Greater Washington, um, Flock, different Flock from this Flock for Love of Children, does after school tutoring for kids that can't afford it. And then APTS, which is um, Alternative Paths Training School, which is a school, uh, five or six campuses in, in Virginia for um, children with developmental disabilities. I'm on the board there. So um, yeah, the only thing I didn't mention there was just our, our tagline for our, our firm is planning confidence, right? So, you know, because we take our clients through a thoughtful process for planning, we want to give them confidence so that they can then go on and live the type of live, lives that they want to and not worry about some of the things that might keep them up at night otherwise. So um, before getting into uh, kind of some of the, the material here, um, and again, the material is going to be really, it's like, okay, you know, do I, if I've got this good piece of, of um, investment real estate, you know, do I, do I sell it now because prices are so high, you know, should I buy another one? You know, how does the stock market work into all that? And it's all these opportunity costs. Um, and that's what we're going to go into. And again, like, yes, our firm does manage investments. Um, however, you know, I have two investment properties. Like, I, I think real estate is a, a key asset in most people's financial plan. I say most people because you've got to have, um, you know, the time to help manage it, you know, sometime, or you've got to have the knack for to knowing, you know, when to buy and all that, um, and maybe when to sell. But my first is just a quick story about, I I was in the business, I've been in the business for 19 years now. And um, uh, uh, now this story was, you know, 18 or so years ago, I went out with a senior advisor to go see two clients one day. And both clients were on, on, on their balance sheet, same net worth. You know, let's say they're both worth, they were both worth $8 million, okay? First client worth 8 million, um, was a family that had a bunch of, um, most of their net worth was in real estate. You know, they had, um, <clears throat> you know, some strip malls, a couple of residential real estate units, and then only, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, a million dollars in the stock market. Okay. And this guy was, was the whole family was very relaxed and kind of like calm and, you know, like, it's just very, I don't know. The guy was like, didn't really have a care in the world. Like it was, I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then the next guy was exact opposite, only had like a million, a million and a half or so in real estate and the balance of that in the stock market. And this guy was like scared of his own shadow. You know, he was like super nervous, like just jittery and everything else. And like after those two meetings, I'm like, those guys are worth the same. But one guy is just having a panic attack and the other person is just more, you know, calm about things. And, and the, the advisor said, well, look, you know, a lot of that has to do with this, their personalities. But The other thing was around the predictability of the income from the real estate that the first family had just is, is, is really nice. Like that's better than sometimes that's better than a, 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 you know, a value on a, on a, um, an investment account statement, right? Because you you can see the real estate, you know, you see that monthly income come in every month. Now, obviously it, it took time and patience, um, and wherewithal to get there for that person. So, I did that. That story really stuck with me um, when I was when I was starting out because it's not all values and not all types of assets um, have the same effect on you emotionally. Uh, so, anyways, just wanted to throw that out there. So, we can roll into that next slide, which um, yeah. So, what I'm going to do is just kind of like pros and cons of real estate investing, and um, same thing with like the stock market. 
right? You know, it's like, okay, what's the good and, and, and the bad about both? Um, <clears throat> so the pros about real estate investing, you know, you know, you can, it's, it's, it's easy to understand for the most part, right? You're like, okay, I see that house, I can buy it and then I own it and I can rent it out, right? Versus like, maybe, you know, a mutual fund or an ETF or, you know, you're like, okay, like I, I own that, but do I own those companies? Like it's a little bit more intangible versus real estate as far as investing in the stock market. Um, <clears throat> investing in debt is safer than re safer with real estate. What I mean by that is, you know, if you, you have an asset that's backed it up, if, if the asset, if that piece of real estate was $400,000 and you took out a loan of 300,000, if the value goes below what you owe, it's not like the bank says, hey, you need to give us some more money because we did this deal based on it worth 400,000. You know, no, you, as long as you pay the mortgage, right? They're not gonna mess with you. If, if you have a loan on your stock portfolio, which you can do, it's called a margin account. If it goes below a certain value, they say, time out, you've got to now give us more money in order to satisfy certain margin requirements. They want a certain amount of, of investment assets relative to how much you've borrowed on that line. And, and typically that can come at the worst time, right? When, when, when does that typically happen? It's when the stock market's down, right? They're saying, we need more, we need to give us more money. You're like, well, my money is in the stock market. They're like, okay, fine. We're going to force you to sell to have more cash be, you know, more stable in that account. So instead of being in stocks, but basically what they're doing, they're forcing you to sell low, which is the worst thing you could ever do. So that's what I mean by investing with debt is safer with, with real estate. Um, real estate can serve as a hedge against inflation, right? As you know, the cost of things go up and also, you know, incomes. So typically do rents, right? So if you have a rent piece of rental real estate that can, you know, help hedge you against um, inflation and costs around you. Um, pros, you can grow your uh, investment in a, uh, a, let's see, there can be a tax advantage to property ownership, which, which we can get into, but there's something called depreciation where you get a kind of a phantom tax benefit against um, expenses that you have in the property. Um, and also there's a certain amount, if let's say you've lived in the property two out of the last five years, you rent it out for a few years and then you sell it, you still get a certain amount of tax-free growth in the, in the property. Um, now look, some cons, right? So um, uh, real estate investments can be more work than stocks, right? It's like, you can always go buy a mutual fund for a hundred bucks and not think about the thing again. With, with real estate, right? I mean, you got to manage it or you should which makes probably more sense, hire someone to manage it. You got to come up with, uh, you know, the down payment. Um, things are more unpredictable, stuff breaks. Um, so that's, that's you know, it's, 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 there's a little bit more going on with a real estate investment um, uh, than a stock market investment. Um, real estate's high, it's, it's expensive and, and highly illiquid. I just say expensive is if to sell it, the transaction costs can be high, right? You know, whatever, a real estate professional might sell, you know, charge, you know, six or seven percent. Um, uh, you know, that's obviously cuts into whatever your overall rate of return would be on the project, um, and and illiquid, right? Like the money that you put down is in the ground. And um, now there's certain loans you can access, like a home equity line, to pull money out of the ground. Um, however, you know, there's there's rules around that, and you have to have a sufficient amount of equity. And sometimes if, if that's the last, those are the last dollars you have, you know, the only way to get the money out of the ground is to sell it. And you don't want to have to, uh, you don't want to have to sell it um, if, if it's the wrong time. Um, and just rounding this out with the cons, um, uh, you know, it can be difficult to diversify your investments with real estate. So what do I mean by that? So if I have, you know, $50,000 to invest, and that's, that's usually just going to get me like one property, you know, maybe, right? 50,000 bucks. And that's one property on one street in one area. You know, uh, you know it's, it's not like diversified in the sense of like, oh, I've got, I can have properties in like multiple cities and multiple areas and different sizes and different rental amounts versus, you know, in the stock market, you could have a fund that, you know, one fund owns a hundred different companies. So you can be more diversified um, instantly with, with, uh, with investments. Um, and I mean, your return 
is uh, on your investment isn't a sure thing. That's also true with stocks. So, but I just wanted to put it on there. Some people tend to think, you know, you can get a certain amount of return every single year if you manage it right. It's just, it isn't true. However, you can be pretty predictable with that, um, making some conservative assumptions. So um, that's it on the real estate front of pros and cons. Um, now the stock market, um, you know, pros, stocks are highly liquid, right? You can sell pretty much at any time, you know, with a, with a click of a button or a phone call. Um, unlike real estate, where it's a little bit more involved to either sell or get money out of the ground. Um, it's easier to diversify your investments in stocks, which we just talked about. Um, <clears throat> much fewer in transaction fees than stocks, uh, with, sorry, with stocks versus real estate. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you can grow your account, um, your, your investment account in a tax advantage retirement account, which, you know, hopefully you're all are in some, some form through your employer or have your own IRAs or whatnot. Um, cons, right? Stock prices are much more volatile typically than real estate. You know, what does volatile mean, right? Like how much does it go up and down? Um, and, and I'm going to mention that last bullet point first is, is that stocks can trigger emotional decision-making. You know, you think about, you know, you're driving around, you're listening on the radio, or you check out the news, you're reading the paper, or, you know, whatever you're doing. And they make it, you know, the stock market is like, man, stock market was down 400. We saw this last week, you know, Friday, stock market's down 500 points. Oh my gosh, it's so terrible. No one predicted this or whatever else. And, you know, that can lead you to have an emotional response versus real estate. I mean, yeah, there's been real estate um, downturns and everything else, but it's less of a daily speculation like the stock market is, which can you can get caught up into. So that's, I would say, a con for the stock market. Um, and also for the stock market, you know, you can sell, selling those stocks can result in, um, in capital gains, right? Whereas with the example I used earlier of if, if you've lived in a place and then you make a rental property, and then you sell it, as long as you live there two out of the last five years, you can hide some of those capital gains, which I think is, um, which is really great. So um, those are kind of the pluses and minuses of both. And I think kind of the, the bottom line here is neither one is better than the other. That they're both, they can both be good or both be bad, depending on what your personal situation is. Um, and I don't know if you guys want questions now, if there's any questions or you want me to keep rolling, you guys tell me. I can do either one. I can ask a quick, well, we have some questions that we know people uh, populated sort of when they RSVP'd. Um, okay. I'm eager about those. And if, if it works now though, Colin, I think one of the things that you can answer now or sort of as your presentation unfolds is thinking about like, you know, when you invest in property, it's not a one and done investment. Like there's continued expenses that go with that and kind of asking yourself like from a, if you wanna be one of those investors that's not freaking out or afraid of his own shadow all the time, <laughs> you, yeah. can, you can be that person and own real estate too if you're not prepared for the expenses that will come up. So maybe you can address that as you're rolling through your slides. Yeah, and I've got a couple points on that, but that's a, that's a you know, when you, when you buy or when you sell, um, and what type of investor, what type of, you know, what your goals are all tie into it, right? Not everyone is, not everyone should necessarily be invested in investment real estate, right? Like if you don't, let's say, either have the time or you don't have kind of the wherewithal or maybe even the opportunity to, to get into it, you know, it's, 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 you don't want to be forced to, to get into it. With that being said, I think if you partner with some trusted um, professionals, you know, who, who, who really do know the market can help guide you like a really great realtor, you know, someone, or maybe a, a real estate attorney, if you don't want to use a realtor. And then obviously on the investment side of things, you know, using a management company, like this is where I see a lot of people get um, hung up where, you know, let's say, oh, you know, my, the, 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 the toilet flapper broke and it's five in the morning and I got to go figure this out for my tenant and they're going to be mad you know, you shouldn't be having to deal with that, you know, have a management company that could be that buffer for you. Um, um, you know, because it's just, if you do that over time, not to mention, you know, oh, someone's got a, their, their lease is up and they're moving out. You gotta be showing the place, going there, you know, okay, now they wanna see it on, on five o'clock on a Monday or, or six o'clock on a Tuesday, you run it. like forget all that, you know, unless you have the time and the interest to do it, that's fine, but don't, get yourself kind of, you know, over your skis if, if, if you don't. Um, and I think on the next slide, um, Laura, I should, 
Yeah, here's kind of like what's going on generally that I think are, are good, is good to, um, to think about or, or for some good discussion points, right? So um, I get a lot of questions from clients. They're like, let's say they have investment real estate. Like, should I sell now? Like, can I sell at all time highs right now? Like, I mean, real estate prices are crazy. Even if they're, you know, getting rental income, they're like, what should, what should I do? It's like, that's fine. You could, but then what? Like, where do you then take your money and, and what do you do? So if you want to go real estate to real estate, you're, you're not really going to get that much leverage. In fact, I've had clients who, 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 uh, who went to sell um, and sold, uh, you know, or sorry, went to buy. This is last year. Went to buy, made it up before the pandemic and uh, had a contract on a house. The real estate prices were already high then listed their house in March of 2020. And they couldn't get rid of the thing because everyone was like scared of their own shadow. And, you know, like you can really get caught if you buy or sell at the wrong time. So I guess my point is like, what are you gonna do with the proceeds if you do sell? If you go into other real estate, you're gonna sell high, you're gonna buy high. And um, stocks are, are also, you know, near all time highs. So it's not like there's any real like deal to get into something else right now. So that's something to, to, to consider. Um, low interest rates have obviously driven up real estate, right? So because the cost of money is so cheap, people can buy more house, whether that's you know their own primary residence or it's a, uh, an investment property, but that all goes into fueling more and more of the val- you know, the cost of real estate. Um, as everyone on this call probably knows, right? Pandemic has also driven up the value of real estate for the most part. I'd like to say, you know, you know single family homes for the most part, but people wanting more space, um, you know, wanting to, to, to just, you know, more people want more space that's gonna drive up the value of, of, of most pieces of real estate. And, you know, we've kind of seen the condo market, right? In, the, in, in most major metropolitan areas, like really kind of dip down as people wanted more space. But now we're starting to see that trickle back because in the end you know we're all social beings you know you kind of want to be around people for the most part right and so especially you know either younger people it's kind of like bookends younger people and then you see people coming back that are uh, older folks after let's say they're empty nesters and uh, coming back in into the city and so um, that's another thing you don't want to get caught is if uh, let's say maybe you have a condo where you know, you've been rented it out, but now you can't get as high of rent that you used to be able to, or it's, it's tougher to rent out. And you're saying, man, I, I guess I should get rid of this thing because I can sell it for a higher amount than, than I could have. And I, I don't want to deal with getting these declining rents. Well, you know, we're at a temporary point in time right now to, to you know, where this is with the condo uh, uh, units. This is what I see. I, I'm not like a real, I don't want to preface this. I'm not like a real estate you know, expert per se, like a, maybe a, 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 a you know realtor would be or whatnot. But this is what I've seen with my clients, what I've read, what I've talked to other people about. So it's like, don't sell at the wrong time just because of a temporary, um, a temporary issue, right? Um, you know, the other thing is, um, you know, the, the 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 stock market is is volatile. You know, what does that mean? Volatile means right. You know, large swings up and down every every day. Uh, potentially, you know, uh, as as investors are trying to figure out, hey, is the economy going to be okay or or is it going to be bad, right? And so people are going to buy and sell a lot, um, and so that's another thing to to factor in. Let's say you it does make sense to sell your property, um, and you want to put money in the stock market. If you time that wrong on the wrong day, you know, because the market can have you know three, four, five percent swings in one day, you know, putting that money in at the wrong time you can instantly lose, you know, a year's worth of appreciation. So if you're going to do that, I'd say, and you're not, you know, up to doing it on your own, make sure you have the help of a professional to figure that out. What's the best way to get into the stock market, if that makes sense. Um, You know, shift from the cities. We we saw, you know, we already talked about that. Um, The other thing is government, the government has said that they're going to start raising interest rates in 2023. Okay. They've, They've got to start doing that. Um, why would they start doing that? Well, what they're worried about is um, inflation, 
where, you know, cost, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen this at the gas pump or at the, at the grocery store, you know, the cost of things are going up around us. Well, if, if they raise interest rates, they slow down spending, because when they raise interest rates, that means more people are like, oh, well, okay, at least I can get like one or 2% in the bank. I will not spend that anymore. I will slow down, you know, the velocity of money. Um, how, what does that have to do with real estate? But if, if interest rates are going to go up, the future cost to let's say buy a property back will go up, right? Because of the, the cost, assuming you're not buying with cash um, and you're gonna get a mortgage, you know, there's kind of like no better time to have a place now that you're already in or you know, be getting into it now in the sense of you're gonna lock in historically all time low interest rates and lock that in for 30 years, right? I mean, that's that's a home run. Um, and I'll, so I'll take a timeout or a pause. Any, Questions on that? Comments? Questions? How much can you get if you just put the cash in your mattress? <laughs> well, it depends <laughs> on what your mattress is filled with. But um, no, it's, uh, you know, if you if you just keep your money in cash, right, either at the bank or at bank of mattress, right, it's, it's, it's not earning anything. And, and the scary part of that is, to, to the point I was, I was making earlier, is about inflation. If everything else is you know, going up around you and something that cost a dollar this year is next year going to cost a dollar two. And you kept that in bank of mattress, then that dollar's worth 98 cents. Then it's worth 95 cents. So it's like, you got to be in the game somewhere in order just to have your money keep up with you. Okay. It's not like, oh, well, I, I made my money. I'm just going to keep it. Well, no, everything else going up around you is it's going to slowly eat away your purchasing power of those dollars. Um, I have a question. So let's, so I think you're making a strong case for like, you know, you, you, again, you don't want to keep your mattress in a, or your, uh, your money in a mattress, or as my uncle Ed used to keep it in a ball mason jar, which was great. He would bury the ball mason jars filled with cash around the backyard. Um, and that seemed good until he got Alzheimer's and they couldn't <laughs> remember where he, so he was just always digging around the backyard. Um, that was that was an interesting period of time um but if you're looking at buying if you're saying okay i get it i feel like real estate is sort of where you lock in interest rates and and you you have a tangible asset and if you have a good management company that seems like a solid bet what about investing in your own sort of portfolio and real estate versus a real estate investment trust and how do those two compare and when do you feel like okay i i need to leave it up to a family of experts in the real estate investment trust versus i i loved and lived in this condo and i think it'll perform well as its own individual rental got it so you're saying like buying a place yourself versus getting a fund that buys places correct yeah yeah so there's um uh, there's there's funds out there you know like like lisa just mentioned called called real estate investment trusts, trusts or REITs, R-E-I-T, that if you're saying, hey, look, you know, I either don't have enough money to come up with a down payment or I don't have the expertise to figure out what place, there are funds that will immediately um, get you invested in a pool of, uh, of real estate, okay? And it can be residential real estate, it could be commercial real estate, you know, it could be office buildings, you know, CVSs, whatever. Um, so that is a good way. And we will put that in our clients' portfolios, even if, I mean, I'm, I'm saying like always, but even if they have, let's say, residential real estate, uh, they own personally that they rent out, but like, it's hard to go buy like, a, you know, a Walmart in Alabama, you know, or, you know, a CVS, like wherever else. So these, these are funds. We like the REIT funds that allow you to get into commercial real estate that normally you have to be, you know, uh, you know, an insurance company or a pension fund or someone with, you know, billions of dollars to get into those markets to, you know, a way for you to get some yield, some predictable income from some of those types of investments without having, you know, needing the hundreds of millions of dollars to get into it. So, you know, then it, it depends if the clients have, or, you know, if you have um, already have uh, uh, investment real estate personally, you know, if you don't, and you don't want to get into it, maybe then you would have more of that exposure in your investments. If you already do, then you might have less just to, to balance everything out because um, what you wouldn't want to do is have be overexposed to it. Um, and then that might lead you to, 
you know, sell when, when that, when that, the price of that asset is down. So, so like, that's, that's kind of like a portfolio construction answer. What, um, what REITs don't do that I think individual real estate does is first of all, I'll go back to, you know, my point of, it's just a number on a statement. Like it's, it's, which is good. Like numbers are good, but like, you can't go by and drive by and say like, that's my place. You know, I, I see that. I get it. I know where it is. Um, you know, like if, if I ever needed to, I can go live there again. You know, there's, there's a, there's a value to being able to, to access it. And then also um, I'll go back to my, my, my original story of how, how much more calm or confident or whatnot the, the first client was that had that just predictable income from his rental properties, right? You know, at that point, he had no debt on him. And um, so, so REITs, you can get income off of. I mean, they pay a coupon or a dividend, but um, it can widely go up or down depending on how good the assets are um, inside of that. And you don't get as many of the tax benefits you do as you do if you're an individual investor, like depreciation, um, like writing off expenses um, or what have you. So um, they're, they can be similar, but um, I would say that the, the, there, there are much more benefits if you want to get, if you're already in it or you want to get in it and you have the wherewithal to just owning some sort of individual property yourself or properties. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that's perfect. And REITs haven't, I mean, REITs have really been around what, the last 20 years, um, but we're sort of a newer investment vehicle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and some, you know, some REITs are like really expensive in the sense of like, they'd have, you know, management fees of two to 3% per year. And if they were paying like six or 7% in terms of like um, a dividend or, or a coupon from the rent they received, it, the, the, the fees really ate it up. That's gotten a lot better with um, REIT um, index funds or what, what have you, because those of low cost is a way to, you know, low cost fund is a way to get into those. Um, but anyways, you know, with, with, with a REIT, you always have to worry about like, who's managing it? What are the underlying properties? Are they doing a good job? Um, because as those properties, let's say the leases come up, you know, then they have to get a new tenant in there and they have to, you know, those properties need upkeep, you know, it's versus if you have your own property, you're like, Hey, you know, you know, dance with the devil, you know, right? Like, I know this, I know that, you know, the, the, there's not going to be as many surprises if you do your due diligence about it, where, you know, if you, you think back in 2006, 2007, some clients had some REITs that were down 40, 50%, like huge because they were invested in, you know, a lot of commercial real estate and some, some speculative um, residential real estate that was over leveraged and you just rode that, that value down, you know? So there's pluses and minuses to both. Yeah. So we have some questions that we got ahead of time um, in the RSVPs. Laura, do you want to, if, if they haven't been answered or asked already? <laughs> Colin's done a great job of weaving quite a few of them right through this presentation. Um, one of the first one, Colin, was trends in condo rentals in, in DC, uh, which I think you touched on with this idea of, of you know, don't, don't, don't panic sell, right? This is a, a temporary moment um, and, and you want to be thoughtful about what that looks like based on per perhaps a migration back to the cities that's already happening. Um, the the other one that came in that could be and, and you tell me if, if you want to touch on this a little bit later um some folks who own multi multi-family properties multi-unit properties um and and enjoying the appreciation on that you know what your recommendation is on on holding and and till the principal is paid off before selling versus um selling now again you kind of talked about this at the beginning of the presentation while the market is so hot right now i think that answer is really what are you going to do with that gain? What are you going to do with those assets? Um, yeah, when, when I can hit on that real quick. I, mean, I, I think yeah. um, it, all, it all depends on what your goal is, right? What is your goal for your money, for that money, you know? And what is your overall plan? You know, I think that um, Fidelity had that commercial where it's like, what's your number? And it was like the green snake arrow thing moving through, you know, like that's a cool visual. But um, 
I really think Fidelity did a, a, a not a great job of figuring out, you know, what's your number? You know, something like, I need a million too. I need five million. You know, whatever your number is to retire is the point of that commercial. Um, however, like, it's less about a number on a statement in retirement, and it's more about how do I generate income, right? Because we all think about, okay, look, you know, I can live on whatever I can live on every month, you know, 3000 a month, 10000 a month, whatever it is, like, if I can't, if I can't generate income from, from the money that I've saved, you know, because let's say it's locked up or because it's down or whatever it is, that doesn't really help me because I still have expenses on a monthly basis, right? Especially if like the stock market is down, it doesn't mean that, you know, the cost of bread, eggs, and milk are down, right? In fact, sometimes it's inverse. So the point is like thinking about and having a plan for um, not just selling that, but then what is my plan for, for creating multiple different streams of income? You know, this much from social security, this much from rental income, this much I can peel off of investments, you know, this much, whatever else it is, whatever your plan is. Um, so so don't, don't sell because the market's high and then not have a plan. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think, um, Laura, on that same sort of earlier point about um, kind of the condo market and where we are right now, I think as people look at whether to get into or, or whether to get out of the condo market, um, there, there's the value of your individual unit, but you have to keep that, um, uh, you have to contextualize that with regard to the entire building. And so you may be in a five unit building, you may be in a 500 unit building, um, and your particular unit will have a certain value, but you wanna understand that value in relationship to how well that, that building is performing. Um, so, so, you know, obviously I, I, I would agree with Colin um, almost to the 100% around factoring and like, where are you gonna put those dollars? Where are you gonna get something else that's gonna have the same return? Um, but there are different considerations you want to factor in if you're getting into the market, one of which is um, how financially sound is the management of the building that you're looking at if you're buying a condo. If you're not buying a single family home, you have to factor in like whatever building you're buying into, you're becoming um, business partners with a lot of people that you've never met before and you guaranteed some of them you won't really have a lot in common with and you may not have the same values in common uh, with how you you believe that building should be managed. So if you're in a historic building, you need to, to think through all the different maintenance elements and, and possibly deferred maintenance and others for big ticket items that will need to get handled like large scale pointing or masonry work or roof replacements or window replacements or uh, hallway restorations, just the different things that, that, that are included in making sure that buildings are well maintained. Um, deferred maintenance can be particularly expensive, so it will benefit the day to day expenses for the people that are deferring it, but it will certainly like uh, be a huge hit to the people that are sort of left holding the bill for the things that just have to get done. Um, so you want to do a lot of due diligence around how that investment will perform. You can have a lot of control over your individual unit. Um, but the external factors, which we talked about earlier, which would include, you know, the rental market and, and whether or not that's favorable or whether it's in a point of adjustment. Um, but you do want to look at, uh, are the condo fees accessible? Are they looking or trending as if they're going to need to be raised? Are there special assessments you're going to need to pay? Um, are there things that you're not expecting? And then finally, one of the things you really want to factor in is your governance documents. And if you're in a condo building where you believe that you may not be able to exercise the right to rent your unit out, that's an, that's an investment property you want to exit. Um, you may get a two-year window to rent it out out of five. You may um, be put into a waiting list. It may be that there are, own, um, there are rental ratios that you'll uh, come up against where you're allowed to have, you know, 10% of the building can be rented, 50% of the unit can be rented. Those are all things that you want to study um, because there's nothing worse than having a rental property that you can't rent out because there's a restriction on rentals in whatever community you're in. Um, and a lot of investors won't factor that in. So if you want to buy and stay in an investment for the long haul, you want to make sure you have the right to exercise that option. Um, and if you're in a property now where you're feeling like, oh, wow, the stock markets um, or the, the, the real estate sales market is hot. It's a seller's market. And you're feeling like, I, I, st I still want to be an investor, but I, I have more restrictions in this building I'm in and or it's not performing that well and or it's financially not in the best shape or and or it's physically not in the best shape. This isn't the worst time to say, maybe, I, I, maybe it's time to sell this one and buy into something that has more flexibility or fewer downsides. Um, there are some deals to be had in the, in the you know, 
uh, one bedroom studio or, or um, legacy communities in Washington, DC, like DuPont Circle, Adams Morgan, H Street, um, Barracks Row, neighborhoods that have um, a long standing of being uh, popular and rent quickly and, and rent for good rates are actually a little bit more affordable than they have been by comparison. Um, for whatever reason, new new builds in newer or, or sort of more emer emerging neighborhoods uh, are starting to have earlier um, in the year have started to see more uptick in terms of value. And there's been more activity in that segment of the market, um, which creates a window of opportunity. So if you're looking at getting into the market or, sh or shifting what your investment profile uh, or portfolio looks like, you want to factor those different things in because you know the market's not um, hot across the city. Um, there will be some things that you can you can check out that give you a little bit more flexibility as a as a buyer. And I think in, in the condo market in particular, a lot of people don't go in studying what their requirements are if they want to rent those properties out. Um, so if you want to have sort of the absolute best value um, and return on investment. If you're looking at getting into the market, the very best thing you can do is buy yourself a single family home. Um, and, and even better, a single family home in Washington, D.C. proper is typically going to put you <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a good spot. That, of course, is what everybody's looking at right now. So don't overlook the idea that some of these condo buildings can actually offer great value in, in neighborhoods that for the long haul will always be well established and, and will be a, a great return on investment if, you, if you're looking at it from kind of the long game perspective. Real quick, two points that I thought of, Lisa, while you were talking that um, that I've seen people kind of miss the boat on it, it, that when they are thinking about being a real estate investor, or they already are. Um, and, and number one is just looking at it from a cash flow perspective. You know, let's say I'm getting twenty five hundred a month rent. But my expenses are twenty five hundred a month. Right. Like I'm not making any money, I'm not making any money. Well, first of all, your mortgage is getting paid off. OK, so assuming you don't have an interest only mortgage, which those are mostly gone now, um, you know, don't forget, like looking at that mortgage statement, you're like, oh, well, I've got twenty five hundred, about eight hundred went into my pocket. Right. That is that is paying off debt that's going on to your balance sheet. So don't forget that. Uh, and the other is depreciation. So I mentioned that earlier. And, um, you know, if you don't do this right on your tax return and th this is why when as soon as you get an investment piece of real estate, I always recommend stop the TurboTax. I mean, you can use TurboTax, it's fine. I'm not, nothing against TurboTax, but like it helps to have a, a CPA or an accountant know to correctly factor in depreciation on, on that property. What is depreciation? The IRS lets you uh, take the usefulness of a, uh, of a business investment, whether that's a you know condo or a tractor or whatever, you know, whatever you use in your business. And they let you actually um, depreciate it, which is like they, 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 they let they, they say the value of that will go down over time, the usefulness of it, which it's not, but like they let you do it. So what happens is they divide up the value of whatever, whatever it is. Let's say it's uh, we'll use ease of math purposes. It's, you know, because the depreciation is over, you know, whatever is like 20, 24 okay. years. So let's say it's a two hundred forty thousand dollar. Right. No. Twenty seven. It's twenty eight and a half. 28 and a half. Okay. 28 and a half. So it's, let's say it's a uh, $285,000 is the value of your property or whatnot. You can't depreciate um, land. It's just the value of the, the bricks. So that means every year you have $10,000 of tax break that you can, that comes back to you that you can shelter that much in terms of income from that property. So over time, and if you don't, if you don't use it, it kind of like it stores up in this uh, like phantom tax tax free account that you can use that your accountant has to know to 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 track accordingly. But I'll go back to that same example of you know twenty five hundred a month uh, 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 I'm getting in rent and twenty five hundred a month um, are, are my expenses. However, you're also getting this tax credit that over time, as your rents continue to as you can raise rent. And now all of a sudden you are making money, right? Your cash flow positive, therefore that's income, therefore you should be paying tax on it. But because you have depreciation, maybe now that you're charging three thousand dollars a month, even though it's got twenty five hundred a month in expenses, that five hundred dollars a month you're getting tax free. Okay, so so from a cash flow perspective, don't forget to factor in those things. Now, if you ever sell, you got to pay that depreciation back, so you pay the tax later on. 
But if you buy and hold it and pass it to next generation, it's, 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 it's done. You kick the can down the road. So from a current, you know, the hardest part of it, you know, getting into real estate is the early years, right? Because the rent's the lowest it'll typically ever be. And you're not paying yourself back in terms of an, an amortization scale on a mortgage, um, um, you know, because, you know, in the early years, it's mostly interest. So if you can just get past those first five to seven years, you know, it'd be smooth sailing for the most part. So just wanted to point those two things out. I just wanted to jump in real quick. We've got a little bit less than 10 minutes left and I wanna make sure we get to the rest of your slides, Colin. So if you have questions, make sure to pop them in the chat. I wanna get them before um, we uh, release you guys for the night. Cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, and I think I've, I've, uh, I've talked about a couple of these points already, but um, just to go through these, you know, it, 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 it can be attractive to try wanna sell right now if, if, the, if the values are at all time highs, but then it's like, what do you do with the proceeds, right? That's, that's important to consider. Um, and, you know, one thing on year that I don't think I have to is taxes. A lot of people don't, they forget about taxes, right? They'd be like, wow, you know, I, um, I bought this place, you know, seven years ago for 500,000 and I could sell it for 800. Okay, that's fine. But you have 300,000 of gain that'll be taxed at you know 15 or 20 percent plus state so a third of that so you know you know hundred thousand dollars you're gonna pay in taxes so you're not walking away with 300 you're walking away with 200 so don't forget about taxes um you know the other thing is making sure you're the right type of a person um for the endeavor right so um you know, don't, don't be frustrated or overwhelmed by trying to do it all yourself if you don't have the time or whatnot. Like use a property management company and your hassle factor will be much lower. And, and in the end, it'll, it'll, it'll make a much more, you know, psychologically, uh, uh, you know, happy or whatever, a better endeavor for you. Um, the other thing uh, that, that, that might make sense to look at selling is, you know, if you lived in the place and it was your primary residence, then you moved out and you started flipping it over uh, to be a, to be an, an investment property. As long as it hasn't been more than three years uh, since you lived there, you still get that tax benefit of two hundred fifty thousand dollars of of tax free growth on the appreciation. And if you're married, you get you, you both get it, so five hundred thousand. So that can make it a little bit more attractive to to sell now if you know, hey, you know. In, 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 you know, in six months or whatever else, that door is going to close and we're not going to have that tax benefit anymore because we will have been outside that two out of the last five year window. Um, and then lastly, like don't have a thin cushion for your property. Like you should always have uh, an emergency fund for that, you know, for if stuff breaks or it doesn't rent for a month or two, because then you're not pushed to make drastic decisions, you know, drastic decisions. Do I, I got to sell now because I don't have the money to fix X or it's not rented. I, I need to get out of it. Right. Um, so those are just some of the, the things that I've noticed over time as far as considerations go. So, um, so yeah, so you, those are my last couple points, Laura, you tell me what else. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone typed in, could you explain the concept of uh, recapture? Um, is that the, the higher capital gains when you sell? Is that what that, that concept yeah. is kind of, yeah, yeah. So, so let's say we'll go back to that um, example of your properties worth two eighty five, and you have you can depreciate ten thousand a year, um, and then let's say after you know after ten years, so you've depreciated you know twenty eight thousand dollars or whatever of it, and um, then you go and sell. You then have to take that twenty eight thousand and then pay tax on it again. Like it 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 deducts from um, it adds to how much of your is your taxable gain. Like you got to have it come back. So it, it helps you in the near term. Um, but in the longer term, it, it will come back if you then sell, because that's just how the IRS has worked it. Yeah. And on a, just a tax basis overall, I mean, I think taxes on, on, on the plus side and on the negative side are something most folks don't don't really consider when they're um, maybe what you might call an accidental landlord where they had an investment property that they put into place after they lived in it and decided to sort of buy and hold it. But the depreciation is a big bonus just in terms of improving the cash flow month over month and, and year over year. 
Um, you can also keep in mind that when I talked earlier about looking at you know, condo fees and other expenses around being in a building, um, condo fees, insurance, um, private mortgage insurance, all of those things are not tax deductible when you're a homeowner, but they do become tax deductible when those properties are investment properties, because what you're essentially doing is converting that uh, property from a, a residence to an investment and to a small business. And so you get to enjoy a lot of different tax breaks that you wouldn't normally have had um, if you're just living in that house on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely. So having a good uh, accountant and or um, not TurboTax, but some other version. <laughs> Don't count on TurboTax, but it's if you are going to be folding investment property into your overall investment strategy and, and thinking about the pros and cons of, of buying, selling, um, or even adding to that portfolio, a good, a good accountant can help you map out what the different tax incentives will be. So you truly understand what the month over month and annualized operating expenses are because they're not what they seem to be. They're not just, oh, I pay my mortgage and that's, those are my expenses out. And then I have rent and those are my, that's my income in. There's always, there's a lot going on in the margins and you wanna make sure that you're really tracking what it, what it means from a cash flow perspective to have property in your portfolio. Awesome. Laura, anything else that we left uncovered? We got it. No, I, I think uh, that's it. I, I um, wanted to give a shout out for the, the folks that asked questions. I know, you know, every situation is super unique. So please, if you want to be put in touch with um, Colin or have additional questions about your specific situation, um, please definitely reach out. We'd be happy to kind of walk through what that looks like um, for you individually.